the key in Christian walk is really, is really, uh, it's really pretty simple. The intimacy of our relationship with Christ, the strength that's built into us through our understanding of who we are in Christ through the Word of God. Um, those are pretty foundational. So you know, you know, you say, well, it's not structure in the sense of how many Bible verses you read every day or how many hours you pray. Some of y'all are going, hours? <laughs> hours? How about minutes? <laughs> uh, but uh, that's not... You see, it's, you see, prayer is about creating intimacy. It's just all it is. You see, without, without intimacy, there isn't a relationship. And what prayer is, is about us creating intimacy between God and us. Now, He knows everything about you. The problem is, we need to know more about Him. And it says that the Spirit of God searches the heart of God to reveal the mind of Christ to us. And what happens is, you can't get that unless you spend time with I, I uh, This week, this week, uh, I will celebrate with Denise. Um, I, and just know that she was a baby. She was just a baby. She will tell you how much younger than she is than me. Gladly. <laughs> uh, but um, we will celebrate 38 years of marriage. And yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the deal. The reason why we've been able to be successful in that is that we have maintained and created intimacy between ourselves. We talk. We spend time together. We we, we know each other. We share. There are things she knows about me nobody else knows except for Jesus. And that's the way it's going to stay. Just telling you that. That's the reason why I haven't taught a marriage class with her in a while. Because she tells everybody. <laughs> Some of you all remember. <laughs> but uh, they came. It, it drew a crowd. That's what happened. It drew a crowd. <laughs> it's like. I sat over there and turned red, and she laughed, and everybody else enjoyed it. That was just... <laughs> but uh, the reason why we've been able to take this journey and, and, and to stay in this journey is the intimacy we share. And it's the same way in your journey with Christ. If you don't spend time with somebody developing intimacy, you, your relationship will fracture. But prayer is merely about creating intimacy. And the Word of God is about understanding the dynamics of that. It's about knowing who you are as you know who God is. It's a great love letter to you explaining who God says you are and what he says about himself. And if you'll just spend time in it, it's amazing what God will do. So I encourage you, become uh, lovers of the word. It is amazing what it would, would do. I, I love it when you call, call or text and say, I've been studying the word. Can you help me with this? That just makes this pastor go, yes. Because it, it speaks to God's building a relationship with you. So that was all to say to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, the writer of Proverbs wrote a verse. He said in chapter 11, verse 25, he said, A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Uh, the King James, it says, uh, A liberal person... Uh, and what it, 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 the idea there, the word that's used for liberal or, or generous is the word that's often translated blessed or blessing. Those who bless or are a blessing will receive blessing from God. And, and that where it says that, that if you refresh others, the actual translation is if you'll bring water to others, God will pour water on you. And if you've ever been in the desert, like some of I, I know our military personnel, I grew up. Uh, in the desert, actually. I grew up in West Texas in Southern California. And here's the deal. When you don't have water, you're in a bad way. But when somebody can just bring water and it's cool and refreshing, what says when you do that for others, God will bring it into your life. That's where it, that high, whole idea is there, that whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. The idea is that if you're a blessing to others, then God will bless you. So as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I want to just 
pull this passage where Paul talks about this, and, and he uses an example, and he's talking to the church, and just don't get nervous here. We've already taken up the offering. <laughs> We've already taken up the offering. <laughs> so here's the deal. I, I want to talk about a bigger concept. Uh, I want to talk about living wide open. Living wide open. And so in, in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, I want to read the first six verses. And it says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled uh, up in rich generosity. Notice those two things that don't seem to go together. Overwhelming joy <laughs> and poverty. Yet in that, they blend it together. And here's what happens in that. It says this, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us so that we urge Titus, just as, when we had, as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also the completion of this act of grace in your heart. But since you excel in everything, speaking to the Corinthian church, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in the comp and in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. And the word giving there is the same, that, that idea of being a blessing. So what I want to just share with you is if we're going to live wide open, live wide open, living in that abundant, blessed place, it's because we have developed an open heart. That we have developed an open heart. You see, generosity, and we're going to talk about this, we're going to talk about for the next few weeks about just being generous. But generosity is a grace thing. It's not a it's not an obligation or a duty. It's a grace thing. It's walking in God's unmerited favor. It's walking in that place where you just, you didn't deserve it, but God just has in his joy decided to pour it out upon you. That's what generosity is. And, and, and what we want to understand, and you say, how does that work? Well, I want to take a little journey with us over the next little while and, and, and kind of find out how that works in our life. Paul said, we want you to know about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. And in the end, he says to the Corinthians, see that you excel in the grace of giving. He's, he's talking about, he's using this example, that this grace that started in these group of churches, these group of people who really had nothing, they were, they were, they were bringing nothing to the table, literally. But what they did was they gave out of their need into the abundance and to meet a need in somebody else's life, and they discover grace. And here's what Paul says to the churches. Man, get excellent at this grace. Get excellent at it. And we strive, we want to strive for excellence in all we do, especially in the things that we do in light of the Lord. You see, this grace is this conduit by which we experience God in our life. Even Paul writing to the Ephesians, he says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Everything we walk in, everything we have is because of God's grace. It's because of God's grace. If you woke up this morning and you took a breath, that's grace. If you had food on your table, that was grace. Not say grace, but it was grace. If you were able to, to experience the sunshine, that's grace. It's grace. It's all grace. And what I want to just share with you is that that overflow, that being wide open in this thing is when we truly live and understand this grace in our life and let it flow out of us as much as it flows into us. Okay, so I, I want to just talk a little bit about that uh, this morning and over the next few weeks. Generosity is living in God's grace. 
when all the components of our lives are available to God for His grace to be displayed, when our time, our talents, our, our resources, we just say, God, I just want Your grace to be displayed out of my life. I just want it to flow out of my life. I want to walk in Your grace. When you get in that what place, there's amazing things that can happen. You see, I want to live in all of God's grace. How many of you know that God's grace is richer than we've ever experienced. You know, one of the things that, 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 that I, I, I've, I've discovered in this walk with God, and I'm some 40 years into this thing with the Lord, and, and, and one of the things I've realized is I haven't begun to even understand how rich is the grace of God. I, I tapped into it. Maybe you have too. Maybe somewhere in this you came into a relationship with Christ and you discover one of the most immediate things that we understand in God's grace is this wonderful thing that's called the forgiveness of our sins where the shame and guilt of our life is taken away and we're restored to right relationship with God and we can have intimacy and, and with God and we're restored to that. That's an amazing thing. If, God, if that's all God did, it would be worth it all. But he doesn't just stop there. He does amazing other things. He brings all kinds of things we didn't deserve into our life. You know, he's brought all kinds of things. He's brought peace to my mind. He's brought hope to my heart. He's brought uh, all these benefits into my life that I didn't deserve. And I keep discovering more and more as I walk this journey. So how does this grace become a part of our life. Where does this grace of generosity come from? What I'm talking about is when that grace that has come into us begins to flow out of us. Where does it come from? How does, it, how does that work? How does, well, there's really only three components in all of our walk with God that control us. And Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, and he was talking about the, the grace or the karos, the gifts God's grace being manifested through us. You know, we call them the gifts of the Spirit, but they're really, that's grace being manifested through us. That's all it is. That word that, that we call gifts is really just grace flowing out of us. Okay? That's all it is. And he says, well, how does these things, what is, what's the regulatory uh, component? He said, here's the thing. There's, in, in, in chapter 13, verse 13, he says uh, that these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. And so he, he, here's the, the components that, by which grace works, that, that God comes, grace comes into us and grace goes out of us. This is how it is. These three things, when we begin to, to dwell and understand and walk in these three things, God's grace will come into us and it will flow out of us. How did you get saved? It wasn't because you did anything. You didn't have anything to do with that, really. God pursued you. He paid for you. He did all the work for you. And all you had to do was say, I believe. So the first component we want to talk about here is faith. Faith. How could the Thessalonians excel in the grace of giving when they were living in poverty? You want, this is something that doesn't make sense to the natural mind. How can people who do not have anything become excellent in giving something? It seems like you should go the other way. That when you don't have anything, well, the thing you should do is, is cling to some more stuff. Try and get more, try and get more, try and get more. Here's the deal. In God's economy, the wonderful thing about this is, and we've discovered this too, is that when you believe that the God you serve has more than enough, you don't worry about where it's going to come from. You just worry about how to get rid of it. It's pretty amazing. You know, we... <laughs> And, and that's what had happened in the Thessalonian church. You know, God had somehow worked into the fabric of who they were, and they became an example to this early church, this fifth, first century church that was blossoming and growing across the known world. And here's what it was. A group of people that had the least became the ones who gave the most. And in the, the process of that, they became the ones that had the most. It was amazing, and, and what Paul's holding out to the Corinthian church, guys, learn something here. Learn how this grace works. And, and the way it begins in our life is that we simply believe that God is enough. 
that he has unlimited resources and that what I have in order in the measure of this world is not really what I have because what I have is in the measure of God's world. Paul writes to the Philippians, my God will meet all your needs according to to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What was he saying? He's saying, guys, and, and if you read that whole context, and it's a great passage of Scripture, and we kind of often misuse it and, 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 and don't play it out. He says, listen, guys, whether I have a little bit or whether I have a lot, what I found out, that God is sufficient in all that. That I can live with a little and I can live with a lot because I know this. He who rules and reigns in my life has everything I'll ever need. And when I have a little, that'll be enough. And when I have a lot, that'll be enough. But what I do know is that whatever I have, he has access to it. And what, what I want to just challenge us is that when we believe that God is who he says he is, that's the reason why you want to read the book. You want to know what it says. You want to know who he is. You want to know the depth of his resources. The reason why we continue to live in poverty is because we don't know how rich our father is. I've told the story a hundred times of, about the, the woman who was a servant that they asked, um, I can't think of his name, Charles Spurgeon, to go visit who was sick and near dying. He goes to visit her and he asks about her. You know, as good pastors, how many you know us pastors, we ask about you. You know, when we meet, we're going to talk, you know, where, where'd you come from? Where are you from? How'd you get here? What you do? Da, da, da. You know, we want to know who you are. And because, uh, you know, we're all about people. And so he's asking, he develops, and she find, he finds out that she was um, the, the servant of a very wealthy woman, and, and when the wealthy woman died, she lost her job, and she, she, she felt like she, she was ab, in abject poverty, and she's living in a hovel of I mean, just a terrible place, and, and, and it, it, she had gotten sick, and, and she said, I only have one possession really left to my name, and it's, it's something my mistress had given to me, and, and she said, it's, it's right there on the wall, and it was this framed piece of paper, and he goes over to look at it, and he finds out uh, that it's the last will and testament of the woman uh, that she had served. And in the last will and testament, she had left everything she had to the servant girl. The problem was the servant girl didn't know how to read. So she didn't know what she had. Here's the deal. You got to know who your God is. If you're going to live in the abundance that he has and be, be free with it, you got to know who he is. I have a God who has no lack. I get confined by the things I see, the environment I live in. But that's the beauty of having this amazing relationship with God is he lifts me beyond that. I begin to see who he is. And so, you know, here's your deal. You know, you're like, man, God, you want me to do what? Any of you who have walked with Christ for very long... He has said to you, I want you to go and give or serve. Or... And we go, uh, really? Just be honest, you know. Oh, I don't have that. You know, you don't, but I do. How many of you have ever sat down with your checkbook and your bills, and then you, what God says, and you go, there's a discrepancy here. And what God's saying, you got to put your trust in me. Now listen, please, I, I am the biggest proponent, and we teach classes on uh, finances and how to do this well. And, but here's the deal, if you want to, the one of the great joys in your life is when you get to that place where you have margin, where you have stuff that you've set apart just so you can give it. And, and that's true in every area of your life, not just your finances. Because you see, when you put margin into your life, the problem the church has today is we can't get anybody to volunteer because nobody has any margin left in their life. And, well, that's a separate sermon. Let me, uh, faith. Second thing, and I, I got to move on. The second thing is hope. 
You see, faith is what brings God into our today. Hope is what brings God into our tomorrow. And you just, you need to understand that concept. What's the difference between faith and hope? Well, faith says today God's faithful. And hope says tomorrow God will be faithful. And we need to understand that that, that, that understanding of knowing, because you see, one of the things we're afraid of is what's going to happen tomorrow. But when we have hope in Christ, we don't worry about our tomorrows. For one, we don't have a guarantee of it. Yeah. Anything can happen. But what we understand is, is that because God's not limited by time or space, he's already in our tomorrow, so he's already taking care of it. I don't have to worry about it. I'll take on that when I get there. But today I'm going to believe that all my tomorrows are in God's hand and that ultimately my great tomorrow, I will have a place that will be so amazing that nothing in this world will measure up against it. Matthew 6, Jesus teaches his disciples and he says store up for yourselves treasures do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also see so hope is this assurance that i don't have to protect for this world (laughs) i don't have to because i'm investing in a world that's yet to come. The liberty of heart and spirit comes when we discover the grace of generosity is not in holding on to stuff, but releasing stuff because we believe that God's going to take care of our tomorrow as well. One of the saddest stories in the, in the Gospels, and we've, I've mentioned it in the last few months of several times, is the story of the, the rich young man, King James, rich young ruler, uh, a guy who had a lot of stuff, and he came to Jesus, and he asked him, what must I do to inherit, inherit uh, eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And, and he said, I've done all that. And Jesus, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, he lied. How many of you have kept all? No, you don't. No, no. Shh, don't do that, Jack. <laughs> well, <laughs> and so he goes, Jesus says, okay. In verse 21 of Matthew 19, he says, Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be whole, if you want to be in that perfect place, go and sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And it says that the young man went away sad because he had a great many things. And here's what I want you to see. There's nothing wrong with having anything. I'm, I'm not... Please, that's not the point here. But if you want to walk in hope, you realize your hope is not in the stuff you have, but in the God you serve. And if he says, go sell it all and give it away, then you say, okay, God, where? Because you see, there is something amazing when you learn that what you have is not really yours anyway, and it can go away in, as they say, a New York minute. It can go away. And we've seen that happen over and over in the history of mankind. It's done it over and over. What I love, uh, Jim Elliott, who was a missionary to the Ucas Indians in South, in, in South America, he and five, four, four other guys were martyred at taking the gospel to them. And it's a wonderful story. And if you ever get a chance, you should read and and study this story. It's an amazing story about how God used his wife to go back and how that whole tribe of Indians became uh, followers of Christ. But he wrote a quote, and it's one that we have heard many times. But he simply said, He who's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And what he was saying is, I can't hang on to anything in this world anyway. I'll just give myself and all I am and all I have away. Because what I'll get from Christ, you can't take it from me. He understood, even if he died in the service of his king, living out his life in Christ and giving himself away, he was going to win anyway because you couldn't take what mattered from him. And what we do is when we begin to get into that mindset, we begin to say, I don't need to cleanse the stuff. 
I need to be free. Now, please, I'm not asking you to be unwise or, or any of that. Please hear me. But, you know, God's looking for wide open living in faith. I read a story about a young man in England who was riding his bike to work and uh, was hit by a car. He ended up being paralyzed from the chest down. Uh, during his recovery from that, he had a stroke so that his right hand became pretty much useless. And, uh, I mean, you know, that could be a, you can be in a bad way. He had reason to be despondent, despair, and, but he had a great attitude. And it turns out that there was a procedure that might could restore to him his ability to walk. And, and so, but it was very expensive, and in the, the universal care of England, they did not have the means by which he could do that. And so uh, it was going to require a lot of money. So some people set up a fund, as they do, the GoFund or whatever they call it, and uh, began to raise money for him, and it raised about $30,000. Uh, already, And so that was happening. And then uh, it, it came across his attention that there was a boy who had a congenitive disease who had never been able to walk. And, and in the process of finding out about this boy, this boy, there was also a procedure that could be done for him which would give him the ability to walk. But it was, again, something that he could not get through the health care that, that he was going to have to go to another country. It's going to cost $100,000, you know, and it was way beyond their means. They had tried to raise some money for him, but it had only gotten about 17, what's equivalent to about $17,000. And when this guy heard about that, he said, he's never experienced what I've already experienced. I will go on. I can be, uh, I can be a, a handicapped person, but what I'm going to do is I want to so into his life. So he took his $30,000 and he sewed it into the life of that boy and with the others that come on board that boy had the opportunity to walk. What was he saying? He's saying, guys, there's some things that are worth more than what you get in this world. What I want to just say is there's something exciting when you know that this is not the ultimate measure of your life, what you have in this world is not what makes you worthwhile. It's what you have in the world that is yet to come. When you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I will one day leave this world and my riches are not here. They're solidly in the hand of God. I want to challenge us. You see, hope is a powerful thing. You can, you can walk through a lot of things if you believe it's going to be worth it. Oh. So living wide open is like, I don't have to worry about tomorrow because my tomorrows are in the hand of God. The last thing, is love. The Thessalonians had discovered something. And Paul writes about it in verses 5 through the end. He says, They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as we had earlier made a beginning, to bring to completion the act of grace in your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see to it also that you excel in the grace of giving. You see, there is a quality that happens when you walk in this amazing thing called love. When you love God and have a result of that, love people. And that's what he was saying the Thessalonians had done. In verse oh, 6, he's, oh, excuse me, in verse 5, it says, They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. What they had learned is that because of what God had done in their hearts and lives, they had discovered that they could love God with all their heart, mind, soul, strength, and body. They had discovered that, and that out of that would flow this amazing other component, that they could love their neighbor as themselves. 
And what I want to just share with you, this is such a godlike quality. We all know, we've seen it all over there, John 3, 16, we've seen that verse. But if you really listen to it, what does it say? For God so loved the world he gave. Here's the thing, if you want to walk where God walks, you go in that place where you fall so in love with God that you're willing to give yourself to him and to those who he cares about. love God and then we love people and when we do that we become we can walk in this grace of generosity it's amazing and it's amazing what it'll do oh, I don't, didn't ask but I'm going to do it anyway yesterday uh, or this week Pastor Rock had some tests done we've been praying for him I know he Kind of wants to keep that on the down low, but we've been praying for him. Uh, he's had some uh, colon issues, and uh, he went and had some tests done. And, and praise God, the results of that, it looks like there's going to be treatments that are really radically going to help him. Praise God. Uh, he's been a pretty miserable puppy here, and There's some things that I, that I'm not going to go there yet. Uh, he's, he's on a pretty heavy dose of steroids. I said, if you become Lyle Alzado, though, I'm just going to, you know. <laughs> some of y'all don't know that, but if he sits on, I'm Arnold. <laughs> but uh, hopefully, uh, no, I hopefully, with, by faith we believe this is going to just result in his complete uh, healing and restoration. So, But what's interesting, he was talking about um, going and having these treatments and, uh, and that he's doing all this through the VA uh, which we're grateful for that for, for his life and his service to the country and we're grateful that that's coming back to be a blessing to him and he was talking to me about how and, and you don't hear this a lot because you know we hear how I many you hear the nightmares about the VA and there are some and he's had gone through some took him over a year to get a surgery he should have had done in weeks. And, uh, but the hospital in Charleston, the VA hospital, uh, he said, it's the most amazing place. He said, they just, uh, they're just amazing people. And uh, he was talking about, he said, uh, he was telling me about how he, they had to, he had to give a lot of blood after this procedure and he had already given a lot of blood. And so they were, this nurse was just a little concerned. Now, this is a nurse in a VA hospital uh, who was concerned about him having to do this and what that would do for him. And so she went down to the um, convenience area there and with her own money bought him some food so he would have the strength that was necessary uh, so he could finish this procedure. She didn't owe him that. Why would she do something like that? I don't know where she stands in terms of her relationship with God, but I do know the God character that's residual in all of our hearts. When we begin to tap into that, when we love God and then helps us to love others, here's what happens. We don't care what it costs. We just want to get it done. We don't care if I have to spend time and energy and effort. We don't care if my resources get expended. Because all you want to do is you want to love on God by loving on people. And all of us have been the beneficiaries of that in our life. Somebody lived wide open in our life. Somebody they, they had the faith to believe that God would take care of them and that he would have all the right resources necessary so they could give it away. They believed that there was a hope beyond this world, beyond this life, beyond our tomorrows that they could invest in. And, and, and if it cost them now, that's okay. The payback was way better yet to come. And they had fallen in love with God and they wanted you to experience that love. 
If you're a believer, somebody did that. Somebody did that. They lived wide open. I'm the product of that. Multiple people in my life who just found out it's good to be generous. Generous with my time. Generous with my, with my heart, my affections. Generous with my resources. Mostly just generous with this wonderful thing we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us to live wild. And here's what I've discovered. The greatest inhibitor to the grace of giving in our life is the fear of lack. That somehow I'm going to end up in deficit. I've got to hang on to it. You ever notice that hoarders are miserable people? They're just miserable people because no matter how much they have, it's never enough. And you ever found that the people who have stuff spend more time worrying about protecting their stuff than enjoying it? I've always made this, you know, the people who buy really fine works of art pay a lot of people to make fakes of it so that they can hang those up so that people can see them. And they put the fine works of art into a storage place. That has, makes no sense to me. So I can look at a fake with the knowledge that I've got one somewhere else that's in the vault. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. But isn't that what we do? Isn't that how we live our life sometimes? We're so afraid that somebody's going to take something from us that we hide everything we have and then we become miserable. We're so afraid that they'll take from our heart, our emotions. And listen, I, I've had my heart stomped on. But that doesn't mean I want to hold and hide because you see, it's when I give away. And that's what I tell people. It's only when you give your love away that you actually begin to get the benefit of it. You know, the, the joy of being married to Denise this isn't what she's given to me. The real joy is in what I've been able to give to her, and it's not near enough. How I can help her find a life that's the best it can possibly be. Now listen, look at her. There is some benefit. She makes me look really good. She's given me four amazing kids. They're great. I'm so privileged and honored to be their father. I got to give one of them away here in a couple weeks. <laughs> no, we love her fiance. I'm excited about it. He's a good man. And that's a blessing. I have this amazing life. And I didn't deserve any of it. So what I want to do is just give as much away so that others can experience that too. I just want people to experience this amazing thing called grace. To see a home healed, to see a life changed, to see somebody begin to experience what God has done for them. Listen, it's not easy, and it's not fun sometimes, and it's hard work. But you know, it just is the most. Denise and I were going to dinner last night. And I came down our street, and there was a guy stuck in the middle of the road. His car died on him. You know, brand new minivan. Looked like a brand new minivan. 
his car was stuck, and he was like trying to push it, and it was in one of those places where one guy wasn't going to push it anywhere. You know? And he was frustrated. And <laughs> I just, I, I told him, Denise, I'm going to stop and help him. And she's so used to this now, she's like, yeah. <laughs> and I got out, and I said, hey, man, can I just help you? And he was, I want to be able to take care of this, but I can't. <laughs> He said, here, let me help you. Let's just. And it was amazing. And not that we did anything. We just pushed it to the side of the road. But it was an act of grace. His wife came out. She was almost crying. Thank you. Other fellow stopped and said, hey, let me help. All of a sudden, you know, the junk we have in our neck. Our world, our, our city, our community, where we got people being violent and angry. And it wasn't there that day. Across racial and ethnic, all those lines. Just people helping people. Let me challenge you. Let God bring the grace into your life. What I want to do is to start a journey of this thing called grace where we experience a wide open life. And I, it starts with us just beginning to believe that God is who he says he is and he can do what he said he can do. That he's a resource that will never fail us. It, it comes to that point where we realize it doesn't matter what I get in this world or what I have today. I'm looking for something beyond this. I'm investing in something beyond this. I'm, I'm looking for something that will go beyond this. And, and then it just gets capped off with you just out of this amazing love you have for God. He just lets you just love on people. It's amazing what God can do. If you give a cup of cool water in my name. You know, if you love on people, spend time with them, invest in them. If you teach rowdy kids, now you know, Children's ministry in the church is a challenge. <laughs> you know? Being a teacher in our public school system is a challenge. It's a challenge. But thank God for those who've learned the grace of giving. Amen? I don't know about you, but I don't want fear to drive anything in my life. For God did not give me a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and love and a sound and disciplined mind. For God has set me free from fear because his perfect love has set me free. Because he loves me and he's committed himself to take care of me, I don't have to worry be anxious for nothing, but in everything. <laughs> but in everything. Okay? Let your request be known unto God with thanksgiving, and he'll guard your hearts and minds with a peace beyond all comprehension in Christ Jesus. Don't worry about clothes or food. Don't worry about it. 